Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews or conversations, I should say, with spiritually awakening people. Uh, we've done nearly 700 of them now. And if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there are PayPal buttons on every page of the website. And there's also a page <coughs> mentioning alternatives to PayPal. Um, also, we have a team of volunteers doing a number of things. Um, look on the volunteers page. You can see some details, but there are people proofreading transcripts. There are people making video shorts. There are people making chapters on YouTube and uh, a few other things. So if you'd like to volunteer in some way, get in touch. <clears throat> My guest today is Dr. Yvonne Kaysen, MD. M-E-D, C-C-F-P, F-C-F-P. <laughs> I don't know what all those acronyms mean, but um, she is the president and co-founder of Spiritual Awakenings International and the past president of the International Association for Near-Death Studies, IONS, from 2019-2020. Dr. Kaysen is the person who, in 1994, first coined the phrase spiritually transformative experiences, or STEs. She is also the group leader and co-founder of Toronto Awakenings Sharing Group. Dr. Kaysen has had five near-death experiences, two in her childhood and three in her adult life, as well as multiple spiritually transformative experiences of many kinds. She is a retired family physician and MD psychotherapist, previously on faculty at the University of Toronto, and an internationally renowned medical expert on NDEs, Kundalini Awakening, and other spiritually transformative experiences. In 1990, she was the first Canadian medical doctor to specialize her medical practice in the research and counseling of patients with diverse types of STEs. She has over 40 years experience counseling STE experiencers. She co-founded the Kundalini Research Network in 1990, was the chair of the Kundalini Research Network's questionnaire research project. Uh, results were published in Explore, uh, July 2020. She co-founded the Spirituality in Healthcare Network in 2000. She's published six books, her most recent Soul Lessons from the Light, How Spiritually Transformative Experiences Changed My Life, which I just read, and Touched by the Light, Exploring Spiritually Transformative Experiences. She has made hundreds of professional presentations, has given scores of media interviews, scores plus one today, and is in demand as a keynote speaker. So welcome, Yvonne. <clears throat> Thank you, Rick, for having me. <laughs> yeah, you're most welcome. <clears throat> um, all right, so over the next couple of hours, we're going to talk about your near-death experiences, which were all fascinating, um, and I'm glad that hasn't been my path. I've pretty much stayed alive <laughs> to have my experiences, and uh, we're also going to sort of answer, we'll answer audience questions if they come in, and we'll just sort of let the, the conversation flow as it may, this way and that. Um but for starters, where, where would you like to start? Would you like to go a little bit chronologically and, you know, discuss the highlights of some of these near-death experiences and how they shaped your life and why they're significant? Um, and yeah, maybe we can even take a step back from that, which is that in your book, as I've been reading it, you, you eventually reached the conclusion after having many of these experiences that you were not new to this. You, know, you began to remember past lives in which you had had similar experiences and you know been alive in every culture in the world and had gone through all kinds of things which is the conclusion i usually jump to whenever i hear somebody spontaneously having such experiences and right. I, I think well you know they're picking up where they left off in a previous life <laughs> exactly exactly that's what i learned too <laughs> yeah <laughs> hmm. So, sure. so in your case, like you were like five years old or something when you had mm -hmm. your first one? Well, I yes, I now realize um, it. I didn't realize it when I was a child, because as a child, you don't have a barometer of what's, quotes, paranormal and what's normal. It's just what happens to you. Right. But now that I look back as an adult, I realize that um, I actually had my first near death experience when I was five years old. And um, what happened to me uh, is that 
I was traveling with my family. We were visiting relatives in Switzerland, uh, which is where my mom was from. And we were standing at a train station and I was a little, you know, rambunctious five-year-old. I saw somebody, um, uh, a station hand jump off the platform down onto the tracks, run across the tracks and jump onto the next platform. So as a five-year-old, I thought, oh, that looks like fun. I'm going to do that too. So I immediately leaned forward and started jumping on the tracks. And then what happened was, it was like time stood still. It was as as if my life was a motion picture and somebody pressed the pause button. And like, (laughs) there I was frozen on an angle. And all of a sudden, my consciousness or point of perception was up higher. It was like 20 or 30 feet above my body. I could see it down there, you know, the whole scene, everything, everyone, everything frozen in time. And I'm looking down and I was feeling um, nothing paranormal. I was, that was just what was happening. There I was. And when I was 20 or 30 feet above my body, I could see that I was jumping in front of a train that was rapidly coming into the, the station. And I had not looked both ways before I jumped on the track. And when I was up, up, which I now know was out of body, I didn't know that at the time, um, I remember very, very calmly sort of talking to myself. Oh, I see. I'm about to be hit by a train. And there was no fear. There was no panic. Um, I knew that meant I was going to be killed. You know, I was about to be hit by a train and killed. Um, But there was this very unusual calmness about realizing I was about to be killed. And then all of a sudden, it was like, boop, somebody released the pause button. And the movie of my life started going forward again. And what happened was um, a gentleman on the platform reached forward and grabbed my little five-year-old body, pushed, pulled me back on the platform. So I was not hit by the train. And whoosh, the, the train went in front of me. Uh, And of course, my parents scolded me and blah, blah, blah. But the interesting thing I now realize looking back is that that experience, even at the age of five, started opening windows in my consciousness because I started having out of body experiences after that. But of course, as a five year old, I didn't know it was an out of body experience. I remember very clearly Because I used to have, I think it would happen in dreams where I'd see myself, I'd have out-of-body experiences and fly down the street and over to the local schoolyard and things like that. And I remember I started kindergarten that fall. This was the summer before kindergarten. And I made a new little friend. And I said to my friend, like, why I remember this so clearly, I have no idea, but I do. Um, I said to my new little friend, guess what? I can fly. Because that's how I, as a five-year-old, understood it. And um, he's, oh, you can't. And I said, yeah, sure I can. And I remember I climbed up on the, the 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 fence in front of my house. I spread out my arms like wings and I jumped off, planning to show my friend how I could fly down the street. And you know, of course I couldn't. I fell to the ground and my friend laughed at me and went home. But I remember being so puzzled as a child. Like, how come I have such clear memory of flying and I can't do it to show somebody else? But I now realize that it wasn't that I could fly. It was that I was having out-of-body experiences after that out-of-body type of near-death experience. And that frequently happens to people. Um, Like if you've had an out-of-body type of near-death experience, it makes you more open to more out-of-body experiences afterwards. And if you've had a mystical type of near-death experience, it makes you more open to mystical experiences afterwards and everything in between. So that I now realize was sort of the beginning of my awakening journey. Yeah. But I, I had another one when I was 11. I, uh, I remember having the experience when I was a little kid of flying around the house. And I I told my mother, I used to fly around the house when I was younger. She said, no, you didn't fly around the house. But mom, I remember I flew up and down the stairs and all kinds of things. I couldn't convince her. (laughs) So you were probably having out-of-body experiences. I probably was. Um, (laughs) I think there's, as you know, a lot of little kids have interesting experiences, which they lose the ability to have when they get older. They see angels. They they you know they have all kinds of stuff but mm-hmm. then they kind of shut they remember past lives i mean I, I interviewed a guy jim tucker who specialized he took over ian stevenson's work in mm-hmm. studying children who remembered their past lives mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but then after you know five six years old it, it shuts down mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Well, interesting. Um, I'm going to move on and tell you about my near-death experience when I was 11 because it had another interesting after effect that relates to what you you just said about uh, seeing spirits. Is that uh, when I was 11 years old, uh, my family was involved in a car accident. You know, my dad was driving and there was some big accident. We went down a deep ditch and the car rolled over a few times. Anyway, in the course of that accident... I was thrown, it was an old fashioned station wagon. We had luggage in the back. I was, uh, uh, you know, before puberty, just, uh, just turned 11. So I was like 10, just turned 11. I was thrown into the back with the luggage. I had a head injury and I was unconscious for three days. So, uh, it took three days after that car accident before I regained consciousness. But I have always had the memory. And again, As a child, it never occurred to me that this was paranormal because I figured this is what happens to everyone when they're unconscious, right? Uh, I now look back and go, oh, that was a near-death experience. But so what I've always remembered and and still remember to this day, which is one of the interesting things about near-death experience is how the memory seems to be like um, a... hard written into your memory, whereas you forget everything else, you remember things around near-death experiences. But I remember floating above the accident scene so that I was like, you know, maybe 20 feet above the accident scene, and I was looking down at it. And I remember seeing my father, and my father had been quite seriously injured. He had a big scalp laceration. He was blood all over his face. And I was above my father, and I could hear my father saying, my daughter, my daughter. And he has later confirmed this for me, that when he, you know, when they they pulled him out of the car and he was sort of sitting, laying at the side of the road, he was looking around to make sure they'd found, you know, all his children and his wife, et cetera, from the car. And he realized I was missing. They had found my brothers and my sister, but not me because I was stuck in with all the luggage in the back. No one had found my body and I was unconscious. And so my dad was actually calling out for me, he was going, my daughter, my daughter. And he, he told me, yes, this is what he was doing. And, and, and I wonder if that is why my soul was hovering there above my father, because somehow that love connection, you know, cause he was calling out for me and there my soul was hovering above him. Um, anyway, uh, they did, somebody did look through the luggage. They did finally find my body. And then dad said that he, then he was able to just sort of relax and let the, the paramedics look after him. Uh, cause he knew that all of his children had been found. My next memory from that accident, and it's interesting because my memory seems to skip through time, which many NDEers say that happened to them too. Um, but in this one, it did skip through time. So I'm above the accident. Then suddenly I have a memory um, of being in the emergency department of the hospital and I'm floating above my body. And so my body's on one of these little examining tables. I can still see, you know, a little outfit I was wearing. It's actually wearing a little skirt in those days. Little, little girls wore skirts. And um, there were two men, like in white coats, sort of huddled over my body. And I guessed they were doctors that were trying to resuscitate me. And as I was looking down, it was as if the ceiling above me was transparent. I was a bit higher than the ceiling. But as I was looking down, I could see the the top side of this big, round, metallic, disc-shaped lamp. (laughs) And I'm looking down, seeing this. And as an 11-year-old, I didn't know what lamps looked like in an operating room or an emergency department. But when I later on, when I went into my medical training, because, you know, I am a medical doctor, and I did see what the lamps were like in emergency departments and surgeries, I went, Oh, yeah, this is exactly what I saw, but from a top-down perspective (laughs) during my near-death experience. And then... mm -hmm. I was just going to say, one of the things that fascinates me about NDEs is that they provide evidence for, I would say, materialists and skeptics who think that, you know, we are the body, and when the body dies, that's that's it, uh, that the consciousness is independent of the body. I mean, there have been so many stories of people you know, like Anita Morjani and and many other people not so famous experiencing things when they're in a coma or under anesthesia or whatever that they couldn't possibly have known. Mm -hmm. And then when they wake up 
those things are confirmed. Oh, I exactly. saw I saw my uncle getting a candy bar in those in the it was a Snickers bar in the hall in the machine down in the waiting room, and he doesn't like candy bars, but he I saw him buying one, and yet she was in surgery, you know. Yeah. So that yeah. kind of stuff it it provides evidence to me um, and to yeah. anyone who who is open to it that we are not just the body. Exactly. And that those are those two incidents. I've now confirmed both of them, that what I saw while in the near-death experience while out of body was true, what, what my dad was saying. And he said, absolutely. He was going, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter, over and over again. And that's what I heard. And then similarly, what the the, the the top, I've actually never climbed up to look top down, but you can get a pretty good idea of what the top of one of those surgical lamps looks like. Um, and then that near-death experience, um, my memory jumped again. And the next memory that I have is actually the moment that I woke up, the moment that I regained consciousness. So I remember waking up in the hospital and you know, looking around, trying to figure out where on earth was I, you know, figuring it out because I was always a pretty bright kid. Oh, I'm in a hospital, I guess. And um, uh, anyway, I won't go into more of the story, but I want to talk about the after effects because there, this had a very interesting after effect on me that I didn't realize was an after effect again until quite recently as I reflected upon it. But for almost a year after this, what I now know was a near-death experience, I uh, didn't know that then, um, I could see ghosts. I could see spirits. And I never put two and two together. I thought we had been moving house. Our family had been moving house. We were moving from Toronto, Canada to Los Angeles, California when we had the accident. So when we moved into the new house in California, I was seeing spirits. I was seeing ghosts. And um, I was scared. And how I interpreted it as a kid was that the house we moved into was haunted. <laughs> it never occurred to me that something had changed in me that I was now able to see spirits. And they were sort of like wispy figures. They had sort of facial features, but the bodies were quite wispy. They never did anything threatening or scary, but I was just frightened. You know, as a kid, I guess you're sort of taught to be frightened of ghosts. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and, and, um, and that lasted for almost a year after that near-death experience. And then it somehow that um, openness in my consciousness, I'll now call it, it shut down. Just like you said, mm -hmm. in children, things will shut down. Mm -hmm. And a skeptic might say, oh, well, you had a brain injury, and so your brain was wonky, and that's why you were hallucinating and stuff like that. But um, I think our explanation would be that you were just somehow the trauma opened you up to a, a subtler form of perception that you didn't ordinarily have. And so you were seeing stuff that was there all the time anyway, but you couldn't see it. Um, yeah. And I yeah. would say it's a well-documented after effect of near-death experiences, you know, from the research I and other people have done, that many NDEers develop mediumistic abilities afterwards, you know, yeah. the, either to see or to hear um, spirits of departed individuals. So, so yeah, so I now realize that my spiritual awakening journey started as a child, but I never labeled them as such. To me, as a kid, they were just stuff that happened to me, right? <laughs> I think that's how James Von, Pr Von Prague got started. He had some heart attack or some near-death experience, and then next thing he knew, he was able to communicate with, with the spirit realm. <clears throat> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the first experience that um, I labeled in my life journey uh, as something, uh, I labeled it as unusual <laughs> at the time was when I started meditating. When I was in medical school, when I was 23, um, they offered a meditation course at the university that was, they advertised it to help you with your exams. Because as a doctor, there's tons of exams at graduation, before graduation. So um, I took this med meditation course and it actually did help me relax and it did help me study. But I found that, and this connects to something you and I were chatting about before the show started, that we come in with proclivities and tendencies from our past lives that we don't know about <laughs> because uh, I've been a meditator for many, many lifetimes and I've had diverse types of spiritually transformative experiences for many lifetimes, I now know. But I didn't know that at the time. But at 23, when I took this meditation course, I found that 
for me, meditating was like uh, I, I was a duck and I'd been led to water. It was a fit. It was an absolute fit. I loved it. I started meditating regularly, almost an hour in the morning, hour in the evening. I, I loved it. And after about three months of meditating regularly, I had a very powerful experience, which I now know, but it took me 10 years to figure this out, I now know was a kundalini awakening. And what happened was while I was meditating, all of a sudden, I started hearing this really loud inner sound that was like the the roar of a waterfall, like a loud roaring sound. And and the same time as I heard this roaring sound, I felt this really powerful energy move up. It seemed to be moving up my my spine and entire body. It was just this energy moving up, and then it moved up through the top of my head. And and when it moved up through the top of my head, it was my point of awareness also moved up out of my body. And I was up above, but then I expanded my sense of me was no longer like the size of a human being. <laughs> it's like I now this expanded and filled this vast space. And not only had I expanded, but it was as if my whole being had transformed into a force field of love. I felt this really, really beautiful love together with the expansion. And I was so... um uninformed and naive at the time, I figured that this was happening to all the other meditators who were more experienced every time they meditated, and that I'd finally gotten my tooth technique correct that day. So I was finally having the it experience that you're supposed to have every time you meditate. Anyway, I stayed in that expansive state of love until my meditation ended, which was about an hour later. And then I I contracted down into my normal state of consciousness. And I remember afterwards, I was really puzzled why I wasn't able to recreate this experience every time I meditated. So I thought I was doing something wrong in my technique. And I was sort of embarrassed and tail between my legs. I went up to the meditation group leader and I said, I, I must be doing something wrong with my technique. Can you can you tell me what I'm doing wrong? Why I'm not having that experience every time I meditate? So I told the, the meditation group leader about my experience, and I remember his jaw dropped. You know, oh, <laughs> that happened to you. And it's like, yeah, and that was really my first clue that this wasn't happening to everybody else all the time. And then. Uh, and he sort of scratched his head and said, well, I don't know what to say. I mean, the only thing it sounds like that I've ever heard of is a kundalini awakening, but couldn't possibly be a kundalini awakening because you're way too young. You haven't meditated long enough and you have to be in the presence of an illumined guru and he has to initiate you with Shakti Pot. Otherwise, you can't have a kundalini awakening. So I thought, okay, it's not a kundalini awakening. What is it? You know, <laughs> didn't have an explanation for it. But um, through my own research and uh, through the grace of God and synchronicity, and I guess it was meant to be, um, I had the opportunity to travel to India the following year when I was 24, and I met Gopi Krishna, who, if some of your listeners are not familiar with Gopi Krishna, he wrote many books, actually 17 books on Kundalini Awakening. And he was presenting on Kundalini Awakening in India. And um, he became a mentor to me. Like we, I had many personal um, uh, interviews with him and we used to correspond. And he used to say to me repeatedly, Yvonne, do Kundalini research. And I was thinking, why is he always telling me to do kundalini research? And he would say, Yvonne, do kundalini research in the crucible of your own consciousness. But somehow, you know, like the dots didn't connect until many years later. I thought, oh, he was trying to help me figure out that I've already had a kundalini awakening, which I, I finally did realize, you know, reading all of his works and reading many other works about kundalini 
Um, so I now know, and, and for your listeners there, I just want to affirm, you know, I was one of, as you mentioned, one of the founders with Dr. Bonnie Greenwell in 1990 of the Kundalini Research Network, because many people are having spontaneous Kundalini awakenings. And no, you don't have to be meditating for like 40 years, the Himalayas. And no, you don't have to be at that moment initiated by a guru, although it can happen that way if you happen to have a guru that initiates you. But I now realize for me, this is because I've had Kundalini active for many incarnations. Maybe the very first time I got it activated many lifetimes ago, it might have been at the foot of a guru who gave me Shakti Putt and then awoke, awoke my Kundalini. But this is something that I've been experiencing for many incarnations, and I think other people as well, which is why people are now having spontaneous Kundalini awakenings. Yeah. And that's what it does say in the literature is that if you have a Kundalini awakening in some lifetime and then you die, uh, it's going to pick up where it left off in your next lifetime. And I've encountered many people who, some of whom were not even interested in spirituality or anything, and they had this thing happen. And then they got on Google and tried to figure out what the heck happened to them. And uh, I, I remember one one woman who, who initially thought it was some kind of disease kundalini disease and <laughs> and then you know she investigated more and more and figured out something good had happened to her but i imagine you know and you'll you'll probably get into this because you've made a profession of counseling people who've had spiritually transformative experiences but i imagine a lot of poor souls end up in mental hospitals or on um you know thorazine or something or some some drug when they have a kundalini awakening and and don't know what in the heck is going on and mm. neither does their doctor yeah, that's a that's a really really complex question, <laughs> and it has a, a number of different layers to it. But I'll just I'll just try and um, give you a couple layers uh, before we go on to my personal story again. But um, in my work with Kundalini awakening now, and having researched it for over forty years, um, people can have various a whole spectrum of ways that it awakens. Now, some people can have um, a very, very gradual awakening. And this sometimes happens with longtime meditators. And that just subtly, 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 subtly starts activating. And they don't have a big explosive experience like I did. Uh, but then they reach a point in their life where they realize, gee, I'm having a lot of energy rushes up my spine. And yes, I'm having really deep experiences in my meditation. And yes, I'm feeling all my chakras. Gosh, I guess I have an active kundalini. So this is the, the, the gradual. That's the, the gradual awakening. Other people can have um, sort of a, a, a burst at their awakening, like I did, you know, where the energy goes up. But the energy, uh, dramatically, mine went into a mystical experience, my first mystical experience this lifetime. Other people can go into a creative experience, inspired creative experience. Other people can just be feeling the energy phenomena without any mystical or paranormal experience, like feeling their body rocking back and forth, feeling shoots of energy up their spine, etc. It may also go part way up. It may only go to the heart chakra. It may only go to the throat chakra. It might go up to the crown. So there's all these variations. Then there's the other issue of imbalances in your body. Okay, so let's imagine you have from past lives or from your genetics or from your current lifestyle, certain imbalances or blocks to the flow of the kundalini energy in, in the body. And Gopi Krishna wrote about this quite a bit, that one could have a, um, uh, I'm going to just call it a, uh, a spiritual emergency type of, of kundalini awakening that because of these various factors and for each person, they'll be different. Rather than going into a blissful, mystical experience, they feel like they're crazy. You know, well, he had a hard time, didn't he? He did. He actually went into spiritual, emer what we would now call spiritual emergency for many years because it was such a powerful awakening. He was having all sorts of experiences and nobody to um, guide him or help him with grounding. And he, this is part of the reason why I wrote so many books. And uh, he finally found, um, 
uh, intuitively he was guided to um, a visualization technique to visualize the energy moving to the central channel because if you look at yogic uh, anatomy of the, the spinal uh, system and the chakras there are various channels and he realized that it had risen up one of the side channels in him rather than the central channel and that can happen to other people too and um when he got when he kept visualizing it moving to the the central channel all of a sudden everything started um uh balancing out in his system um that was one thing the other thing that he really learned was that with the intensity of the transformation process he was going through it was like um his dietary needs had really changed he found that he had to eat small amounts of food every three hours sort of like a baby you know that he and in a way it's it's like your your consciousness is this baby that's trying to open very rapidly and develop like a baby develops he sometimes called it the second puberty that when the the brain reaches maturity and is trying to now get into its full adult form of consciousness and that you know there's there that the body, mind, and spirit. People sometimes think this is just a spiritual process, but it's not. It's physical, psychological, and spiritual. So you have to attention to the physical body. And he found that eating small meals regularly, easily digestible meals, and for him, also increasing his protein intake. And I have, I have found this myself in times that my energy is very high and people who are, um, vegetarians need to be aware of this if you're not eating meat proteins that you may need to eat other proteins to help to ground the energy it's as if the energy is eating the protein somehow and um anyway so so uh he had to uh all of these factors will affect somebody's spiritual awakening now is it possible you mentioned that someone will end up in the psychiatric hospital after kundalini awakening yes i've seen it happen but I, I do want to give you um, a full answer here, which is some people think there's no such thing as mental illness. It's all kundalini awakening. In my opinion, that is not correct. You know, the mental illness is very real and we need to have compassion and help people the best we can. I'm not saying our current medical system is perfect, which it isn't, but it's the best we have right now. And for people's own protection and safety, we need to respect that certain people need um, the medications and they need uh, supports like psychiatric hospitals. Now, are there some people who have a kundalini awakening and they uh, are slipping into psychosis so that they're becoming very, very ungrounded. They're maybe getting very, very grandiose. The most frequent I see is people slipping into manic episodes. They think they're the second coming of Christ, <laughs> you know, that, that they get these grant, they have the ants, all the answers for the universe. And if everyone would just listen to them, there'd be world peace. And they, they're getting these grandiose ideas about themselves. Now, if I, saw a person like that in my medical practice when I was counseling them. And I talked about it in my, my other book, Touched by the Light, which is a guide, a guidebook for people going through a spiritual awakening, including Kundalini. Um, they need grounding. They need grounding and to realize that like, hello, you're not the first person to have a spiritual awakening. And just because you're having a glimpse of expanded realities does not make you a spiritual master. It's the beginning of an awakening process. We we don't just with one experience become fully eliminated. We're 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 beginning a process of expanding our consciousness. So I have seen people with a spiritual awakening, usually kundalini awakening, slip into mania and those people sometimes actually do need to be hospitalized as well for their own safety. I mean, I saw one person like that who tried to jump off a high bridge because he believed he could fly and he ended up being seriously injured. So, so it's not a black and white situation. And are there people who are having unhealthy kundalini awakenings because of their own blocks? and issues and maybe their genetics and their lifestyles or whatever that are ending up in the psychiatric hospital. Yes, I think that's also true. So there's various categories. It's not a black and white answer. Um, 
uh, about the relationship between psychiatric illnesses and spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really a detailed science. I don't know if you know Joan Shiver Pita Harrigan. Yes, uh, I do. Yeah, (laughs) Um, she's a friend of mine too, and um, she's written a big thick book all about the detailed knowledge of, of Kundalini and all the various ways that it can be misdirected and, and, and properly directed and so on. And she's revising it. It's becoming an even thicker book, but um, it's not a simple thing. And um, no. yeah. Yeah. So I just want to say that to your listeners, it's not black and white. It's not all or nothing. There's a lot of individual variations, right. but anyway, and then mm-hmm. one, just one more thing, though. Then there's the proviso or the cautionary note that one shouldn't try to, in some way, unnaturally or forcibly awaken the Kundalini, as some people do. I mean, I had a friend who once did a whole bunch of intense pranayama to make his Kundalini awaken, and indeed it did, but he ended up like in really serious trouble. He, he actually got some kind of burns on his skin, and, and he was very unstable and so on. So you really have to... Um, proceed this is powerful stuff you have to proceed cautiously with it and uh, hopefully with the advice of someone who knows what they're talking about and we often get contacted actually by people who have had some kind of spiritual awakening through whatever means sometimes drugs are involved and they're in trouble they can't they can't work they can't work they can't think clearly and you know they're they're trying to get back to some sort of normalcy and it's good to know you exist because i imagine i can refer such people to you Well, Spiritual Awakenings International is um, where people can go. We have a lot of um, subscribers who are in Kundalini Awakening, and we have experiencers sharing circles, and we have a number of affiliates who do do one-on-one counseling. I personally have retired from medical practice, so I'm not individually counseling anymore. I recommend people read my book, (laughs) Touched by the Light, which basically is a guidebook for people who are in an awakening process, Kundalini or otherwise. But what I wanted to say to what you said is that, like you, I I think it is best to have a balanced, moderated approach to your spiritual awakening process rather than trying to force anything. And that um, the d- divine, how I, what I've come to understand is the intelligence of the uh, of the divine force behind the universe, however we understand it. Um, knows when your body is ready, knows when your consciousness is ready, and that there's something, uh, you know, there are universal spiritual laws, which in yoga, that's in the, the, the eight limbs of yoga by Patanjali, the do's and the don'ts, you know, so lead a healthy, balanced life, live according to the universal spiritual laws, do not die, do not steal, etc. Uh, work on yourself, work on your psychological issues. If you, you know, you need to get into recovery, go into recovery. If you need psychotherapy, go into psychotherapy for childhood issues, whatever it is. Um, so, and meditate, do a spiritual practice. Uh, find one that resonates with your heart. For me, it's yoga meditation. I follow a Kriya yoga path. And that will, um, doing those things will deal with body, mind, and spirit and make your consciousness ready for the awakening so that when the awakening happens, it happens at the right time and not necessarily at explosive intensity. And I, I do not recommend people taking drugs to try and recommend, uh, try and awaken their kundalini. Many people are exploring that nowadays, and I've seen very negative things like you. So I don't recommend that. And similarly, these intensive pranayamas, just like you said, that's the other one that often gets people into trouble. Just, you know, doing a little bit of pranayama as guided by your spiritual teacher, that's okay. But deciding on your own, I'm going to do, you know, four days of pranayama, (laughs) you know, it's like you're asking for trouble. (laughs) Yeah, it can get very dangerous. I'm glad you mentioned Patanjali and the yamas and niyamas. And um, we can come back to this in greater detail later. But you mentioned at one point you had what you called a truthometer turn on <laughs> in you, where you couldn't even tell a very slight lie without some kind of immediate physiological discomfort or, or mm-hmm. reaction. And mm-hmm. um, I feel that one of the greatest uh, shortcomings or stumbling blocks in contemporary spirituality is the lack of attentiveness or appreciation to um, right living and, and ethical yeah. ethical values. It, it's responsible yeah. for all these gurus, you know, having downfalls. And um, 
I, I helped to establish an organization called the Association for Spiritual Integrity, which is doing very well Excellent. and mm-hmm. gaining great popularity. And maybe we can talk about this more later, unless you want to get into it now. But we still have plenty to cover with your mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. your story mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. your various near death experiences. So yeah, so my tr- the truth meter actually developed after um, the next experience that I wanted to talk about, which was the near death experience in a plane crash that happened to me when I was twenty nine. That was. Mm-hmm. A 26 Boy. yeah 26 yeah. sorry yeah that's right so so uh happened you know, in 79 that's why you said 20 yeah happened yeah in happened in 79 yeah. i was 26 at the time right and so uh i was a young doctor at the time and i was a resident you know after you graduate medical school you have to do your residency training to specialize and i was assigned as part of my residency to work in no- northern ontario in winter <laughs> with a native indian community in a remote community and on this particular day, March 27th, 1979, I was assigned on a medevac, a medical evacuation of a critically ill Native Indian woman on a small airplane, not a helicopter. It was a twin engine airplane called a Piper Aztec. And um, we were supposed to fly about one hour uh, from where I was in Sioux Lookout to the, the next largest city, which was Winnipeg, uh, so that she could go into the intensive care unit there for her deteriorating condition. Anyway, making a long story short and cutting to the important part is that uh, as we were flying part way uh, to Winnipeg, we we ran into a bad winter storm, which we get in Canada, bad winter storms. And uh, they say later at the inquiry that they think the air filters of both of the engines froze over first one, then the other. So twin engine plane, two engines. First, we lost one engine, then we lost the other engine. So you don't have to be brilliant to figure out that Oh, we're crashing. <laughs> so, and I immediately heard this, the change. If you've ever been in a propeller plane, you know how loud the motors are. So when the motor stops, all of a sudden it's quiet. So I look up and was like, oh, the propeller's stopping. And then the other one went quiet, the propeller's stopping. And then we started plummeting down to the ground. And if anyone ever wonders what it's like to be in a plane crash, uh, it's like, imagine the worst turbulence you've ever been in. So the plane was just being bounced like this. The pilot was trying to steer it. What he was trying to do is he had lowered the altitude while, while the plane, you know, when he realized we were having engine trouble and he was trying to avoid crashing into trees because it's fully forested in Northern Ontario, but there's also a lot of lakes. He was trying to get us over a lake so he wouldn't crash into the trees and he'd pulled the wheels up and he was trying to do a wheels up belly landing on the ice to try and get us down safely, which is really very heroic. Anyway, as the plane's going down and as the turbulence and as I see the pilot, you know, doing whatever he's doing there, my first reaction is I think like anybody else's reaction. I just felt this intense fear and panic and it just like leapt out of my heart. The thought leapt out of my heart. Oh, God, help. I'm going to die. And and it was just like a reflex. And, you know, I think that was close enough to a prayer (laughs) Had the word God in it that that is actually when my near-death experience started. It was before the plane crashed. And then what happened is, as soon as that came out, leapt out of my heart, all of a sudden, this force field of peace started descending on me. And it was literally like it was pushing down all the fear. And all of a sudden, I felt this incredible peace, this incredible calm. I was no longer afraid. And then I heard an inner voice. Now, up until this time, I'd never heard inner voices before. And I heard an inner voice very clear. And it was a masculine inner voice. And it said, be still and know that I am God. I am with you now and always. And with those words, it was like this incredible spiritual tranquility filled me. And I was not afraid. Plane had not crashed yet. Anyway, I stayed in that state. Uh, the, the plane, uh, the pilot managed to get us down on the ice. We we're skidding across the ice. So heroically, we didn't crash into trees. But as soon as the plane came to a stop, it started skidding. The weight of the plane was too much for the ice that the ice broke. 
the plane quickly nosedive and sunk into very deep water. So I had to very quickly get out of the plane. The nurse and I tried to pull the patient out. We were unable to. The the pilot tried to help too. But anyway, the plane went down. We lost the patient, unfortunately. And then I found myself in open water wearing heavy winter clothes, a heavy coat, boots. It was sub-zero weather in a storm, big wind. And the closest land, there was open water between me and the shore, and there was this really strong current. And um, and away from shore, going out to the open lake, there was some ice. We didn't know how thick the ice was. And so the pilot started shouting, try to get on the ice, try to get on the ice. And um, the voice in my head said, swim to shore. Now, interestingly enough, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but this is actually what happened. I was inexperienced with higher guidance. This was the first time I had experienced it. I argued with the voice. I, I mentally argued with the voice because I'd been trained as a lifeguarding and I, uh, lifeguard when I was younger. And I thought, no, I'm not going to swim to shore. They train you in lifeguarding. If you're in a boating accident, don't try to swim to shore. You're going to drown on the way to shore. So I ignored the, the guidance I was receiving and I tried to climb on the ice. The voice repeats, swim to shore. And finally, the third time the voice said, swim to shore, I surrendered to that wisdom and I turned and I started swimming to shore. The ice was too thin. We could not get on it. It was a really hard and a really difficult swim. And I went under a few times, the lake water filling my lungs. I, I struggled with all my might, kick, 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 every little bit of adrenaline I had to get my mouth above water again so that I could breathe in air. And then stroke by stroke, I was trying, struggling to get to shore. Somewhere in the process of swimming to shore is when my near-death experience deepened. And what happened was all of a sudden I heard that roaring sound, similar to what I heard with my kundalini awakening, like the roar of a waterfall. And and I felt my consciousness again lift up out of my body. And I found myself like 20 or 30 feet above my body. But interestingly, time was still going on. The movie of life was still going on, right? So um My body was still down in the lake trying to swim to shore. And it was really like my consciousness was two places at the same time. And I compare it to a split screen TV that the big picture on the screen, most of my consciousness was my consciousness that was now above my body. But the little picture on the screen was the part of my consciousness at the same time that was in my body continuing to try to swim to shore. And then what happened is that the main part of my consciousness went even higher. I rose up higher and I rose into this realm or state. It's really hard to have the correct words to describe it. What I experienced was I was suddenly uh, visually perceiving that I was in a realm of light and a realm of love. And many people talk about it as the white light realm now that I've read about near-death experiences and researched them. But for me, my personal experience was that the most powerful aspect of this realm was the love. I would call it the realm of love rather than the realm of light, (laughs) the realm of love. Because I was feeling complete, profound, beyond the capacity of my words to describe unconditional love. I felt like I was home. This is where I belong. That, that, yes, I made it home. And in this realm of love that was also filled with light, for a moment, I saw a face of light and then it sort of disappeared into like the cloud light periphery. I just knew things. It's not like things were told to me or explained to me. I just somehow knew things. It's like my soul knew things when I was in this realm of love and light. And I knew that what I was experiencing was the love of our higher power or what I had been raised to call God. And what I was experiencing God to be was not anything at all like what I'd been taught. (laughs) It was not an old man with a long white beard sitting on a throne judging me. Have you been good or bad? That was not at all what I was experiencing. What I was actually experiencing was that our higher power, what what I call God, was unconditionally loving, profoundly loving, and like an um massive omnipresent force field of intelligence 
and love that is underlying, interpenetrating all of past, present, future, everything. And which is really much more compatible with what I later read about in some of the yogic and Buddhist concepts, uh, particularly the yogic model of consciousness and of the, the higher power behind the universe. Infinite intelligence, infinite love, infinitely present. That's what I was actually experiencing. And what I also knew somehow while I was in that realm of love and light was what I think of as me <laughs> would live on whether my physical body down below lived or died in the car, in the plane accident incident. And I really was completely um, detached. Like I had no desire one way or the other. Cause I mean, I was home. <laughs> I was home. Uh, I, I had, so I watched what was happening with that part of my consciousness uh, to the physical body Sort of like how you would watch a um, a movie you're not really interested in, but you sort of want to know how did they end the story, so you watch it so you can know the ending of the story. I just wanted to see whether or not, you know, this woman that happened to be me when I was in a body made it to shore or not. Well, through a series of miracles and coincidences, which I'm not going to go into just for time, but I did manage to swim to shore. There was a really, really heroic rescue by helicopter pilots who shouldn't even have been there, but they were. And they picked up a message that nobody could receive, but somebody did. Like all these coincidences led to my rescue. They brought me, the pilot and the nurse, to the closest hospital. I remember watching from above, which was Kenora. As they landed on the driveway of the hospital, they wheeled out the stretchers from the emergency, put me on a stretcher, brought me in. A nurse tried to take my temperature, and I remember watching her because she couldn't figure out why she couldn't get a temperature reading. She couldn't get a temperature reading because I was profoundly hypothermic. I was almost frozen to death. I was colder than the bottom reading on her thermometer, which was why she couldn't get a uh, reading on her thermometer. And then I heard a voice say, boy, could I use a hot bath? And I was really surprised to see that had come out of my body because I hadn't thought of that. I wasn't planning to say that, but somehow out of my body came, boy, could I use a hot bath? And it turns out that's what we needed. We needed to be reheated. And then the nurses said to each other, oh, let's take them down to the physiotherapy department, put them in the hot whirlpool baths. Maybe that'll revive them. So then they took us down and it was in when they put my body, it was what, what my body needed. I don't know which angel spoke through my body and told them what to do, but but some somebody spoke through my body, told them what to do. They put me in the hot whirlpool bath. And as my body was being reheated, that is when I felt my consciousness re-enter my body. And what it felt like is how they depict genies being sucked into a bottle. It was, I'd been in this vast, expansive space all above above, and suddenly it was like a, I was sucked down through the top of my head into the small confines of my body and then it's like I'm back <laughs> and then I knew that I was going to live that I was going to survive this experience I'm just going to pause in case you want to ask me something before I go into the after effects <laughs> yeah no it was quite an experience and um, I guess I won't ask you anything at the moment uh, but I I found that portion of your book riveting and there were some really cool synchronicities about how you were actually i mean i'll just say it quickly myself i mean the pilot radioed radioed out a signal but there were mountains all around and nobody could pick the signal up but an air canada flight happened to be going over at that moment and they got the signal and transferred it down and then that guy with a helicopter shouldn't have been at that airport but he was transporting the helicopter to somebody to somewhere else and he just stopped at the airport because to wait out the snowstorm and so he got the the message that you needed help and he was only five miles away and he initially came and rescued one other lady your your friend who was hanging and onto a piece of wood unconscious and and then left again and you thought well that's it we're dead you and the pilot but then he came back just in case and ended up seeing you and oh, it was just a, <laughs> I, I i understand that they've actually dramatized this and made some kind of documentary about it where they mm -hmm. acted had people acting it out well they've um, acted parts of it out i mean there's like you put in more details and it's like yeah the whole story is amazing and 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 to me, I mean, as, as it was happening, you're just, you know, in the moment. But now looking back, I look at it just there's so many 
signs that it, there was uh, invisible fingers that were helping. Like there were so exactly. many coincidences yeah. that led to the rescue. Mm -hmm. And that's why I actually wanted to mention those things because I, I don't think it just makes it a cool story. It, it's I feel like that's the way life works, um, at least for those who are blessed with some kind of divine support is, you know, things kind of work out in improbable ways to, you know, save the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, this experience, and again, I didn't know it was a near-death experience. I didn't even have a word to call it. You know, same as the Kundalini. It, it took me years to have even a word to label the experience. When I, after I, after I had this, what I now know was a near-death experience in the plane crash, um, Thank goodness that I had some time off work recovering from the frostbite and the near drowning and the, my physical injuries from the, um, the, the, uh, the plane incident. But it gave me a little bit of time to emotionally integrate because I literally felt like I brought some of that love back with me. I was just like drunk with love afterwards. They have us uh, saying in yoga, love intoxicated. Well, I was love intoxicated after that. I was just so filled with love. I remember that I would look out the window and I'd see the kids playing on the street where I live. And I just had these waves of love coming out of my heart <laughs> for the children. Yeah. You know, I'd see the squirrels running in the tree and I'd have waves of love coming out of my heart for the squirrel. It was just I was just uh, drunk with love afterwards, but it, it also did other things to me. Like one of the most profound gifts I think I got from that is it, it, it made me realize what's important in life and what's important in life is love. And I had been feuding with my father just since I was a teenager, you know, these things happen. And, and it was like, a new emotional clarity or emotional maturity blossomed in me after this experience. I called up my dad after this experience. I said, dad, I love you. Let's be friends. And we completely reconciled. We talked about, you know, some of our disagreements we'd had in childhood and, and we, it was resolved. And my dad and I were able to have a loving relationship for seven years after that until my dad unfortunately passed away. I look at that as one of the biggest blessings of the near-death experience because my dad hadn't changed. He still had those quirks and things that used to drive me crazy when I was in my ego before the experience. But after the experience, it was like I, I shifted into my heart. Like all that stuff didn't matter anymore. All yeah. that mattered was the bond of love between me and my dad. And if people read near-death experience books like, you know, Danny and Brinkley and Betty Eady and, and so many different near-death experience books, you you often find this pattern that these these experiences are very transformative and they, they completely change a person's emotional state and and very often the, the, the course of their life in terms of oh, yeah. the, what they dedicate themselves to. This completely changed the course of my life, completely changed the course of life. The, the, the combination of the Kundalini awakening followed three years later by this near-death experience completely changed the course of my life. But I want to mention a couple more of the after effects because I absolutely lost my fear of death after this near-death experience. I just... I knew that I would live on as everyone else will live on after the death of their physical body. It, I knew this to be true, not only for me, but for everyone. What I also knew to be true for everyone, not, not only for me, was that, that we're all trying to understand or reach the same one God. That there aren't like, you know, there's not a different Brahma, different Allah, different great spirit. There's one higher power who gets it. It's like we're all climbing from different angles of the mountain. So we have different perspectives. But once we get to the top, we realize it's the same one source that loves all of us, regardless of what religious path we're following, regardless of what name we're calling him, it, her, whatever. And and even if we don't believe in the higher power, higher power gets it still loving us, still underlying the universe. And, and it made me much more, um, 
accepting and tolerant of people with diverse religious views that I just saw, you know, everyone's trying to understand the same one truth. They're just coming at it from a different angle. And who's to say that my angle is better than your angle. It just happens to be my angle for climbing the mountain. So this was a really huge change in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I think of religious narrowness, I, I think of the, the, the size of the universe and the the probable number of inhabited planets and how many trillions of religions there must be out there throughout the universe, probably 99% of which believe that theirs is the only true one. You know, <laughs> it seems kind of absurd when you look at it in that perspective. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, much I could say on that topic. But I also wanted to say the other interesting after effect was that I started develop? Uh, I a I had an increase in my Kundalini symptom, and you may have noticed I described that when I went out of body with a near death experience, I heard the same roaring sound and had a very similar sensation to when I had the original Kundalini awakening experience. And in my research, I've come to understand that Kundalini can awaken and and activate we get a kundalini rising with uh particularly mystical type of near-death experiences which is what mine was and and so i had an increase in my kundalini energy symptoms chakra symptoms uh etc but i started developing an expansion of my range of consciousness i had a psychic awakening after the near-death experience. It was maybe about two weeks after the near-death experience. I was going to visit a friend. I was stopped at a red light in my car. And all of a sudden, I got a clear visual image in my mind of my friend's brain covered in pus. Now, how I knew it was my friend's brain, I don't know. I just knew. And to me, as a medical doctor, the symbology was perfectly clear. Like, I got it immediately. It was symbolizing meningitis. And so, wow, um, I now know that was my first clairvoyant vision. <laughs> and I went to visit my friend, and she had a bad headache. And, yep, it turned out that later on that day, she was admitted to the emergency department and diagnosed with acute meningitis, fortunately treated and recovered all right. But this was a beginning. I now started having more clairvoyant experiences. And then I started getting many clairsentient experiences and, and clairaudient experiences. And that this was the beginning of an opening in my consciousness where I was, what was normal for me in my consciousness was expanding to include all the clairs, as they call it, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience. And, you know, I'm a young medical doctor and, you know, you can't talk to other medical doctors about this. So I had to be in the closet about what was happening to me for many, many years. Um, but I wanted to relate this to what you said earlier about the truth -a meter because this is also when the truth -a meter developed, that as, a, as this clairsentience was opening in me, I found that if somebody was lying, I would I would feel it. Usually as a pressure in my third eye center, I'd go like, oh, I, I knew they were lying. <laughs> and and if I, you know, say I'm talking a, a story and I say, oh, you know, I read 60 pages of the book last night and I really had only read 50. It just was a slip of the tongue, not an intention. I would feel like this pressure in my chest, like, oh, I had to correct my, sorry, it wasn't 60. It was 50 pages that I read. I have to correct myself. It was like an obsessive uh, truth -a meter and And uh, I learned that for whatever reason in the divine design, that this was how I am now, you know, that I must be completely honest. I can be silent if I choose not to say something, but I cannot tell a lie. So yeah. that developed as part of my my psychic awakening after this near-death experience. There are stories I'm sure you're aware of in the Vedic literature of sages or of people who were like that. They couldn't tell a lie. And and they they were so their adherence to truth was so clear and strong that um, if they said a thing, it actually had to come true. Mm. So it's kind of the other way around. Not only did they, uh, you know, adhere to the truth, but it, but their words had to make things happen if they mm. spoke them because mm. they were so established in truth. Mm. Um, it's well, I don't think I'm quite there yet, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so so this. 
the the combination of these two things the the what i now know was a kundalini awakening when i was 23 and the near death experience when i was 26 put me on a personal quest so i was researching i was reading all of gopi krishna i was reading everything i could find about mystical experiences about near death experiences about paranormal phenomena Eastern literature, Western literature, you know, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, many, many versions of it. And, um, and finally in 1990, um, I was invited actually by Dr. Bonnie Greenwell, who you know, to make a presentation in California in a Silomar at a conference put on by ITP and this, uh, which is the Institute for Transpersonal Psychology and the Spiritual Emergence Network on Kundalini Awakening. Because they knew I had learned from Gopi Krishna. They wanted me to share what I'd learned about Kundalini from Gopi Krishna. Um, so I, I spoke at that conference and um, Bonnie Greenwell and I hosted uh, an experiencer sharing circle one evening. If there were any people experiencing Kundalini and they'd like to share with us, you know, we'd be available to facilitate. And uh, so many people showed up. We split in two groups. I had one group and Bonnie had the other group. And I was so moved by the stories that I heard of people telling me how much it meant to me, to them, that I was a medical doctor with an MD after my name, and that I even knew about Kundalini, and that I validated that what they were experiencing was Kundalini, because all they'd been getting is labeled as crazy, labeled as hallucinating, maybe told by their church it was work of the devil, nobody to support and help them in their integration. I was profoundly moved by this experience and the amount of gratitude people were expressing. So I went after the sharing circle out for a walk. Uh, Silomar is on the Pacific Ocean, has a big sand dunes park there on the ocean. So I'm walking out on the sand dunes after this experience. And then I had a profound experience, which in my book, I call my calling mystical experience, where all of a sudden it was like... <laughs> My head cracked open and where my head used to be became like a sun, like a ball of light radiating immense light in all directions. And I could like feel and taste the amrita, the nectar dripping in the back of my throat. And in that state of, I guess, I don't know what to call it, illumination, perhaps that my consciousness had become a ball of light. I just knew without anything being said or spoken, there were no words. I just knew that I was being called and that what I had to do now was come out of the closet and I had to share what I had learned about Kundalini and spiritual transformation of consciousness as a doctor publicly and to become an advocate for experiencers. Because experiencers were being harmed <laughs> by doctors calling this crazy, by the public calling this crazy, by their churches calling it work of the devil. And so my life changed completely that day. I came back. It was in 1990. I went to my department head at the university. I'd already had a teaching position for 12 years already, then almost 11 years and I said, I'll, re I'll resign if you want, but I want to publicly specialize my medical practice in the counseling and research of people with near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative experiences. I couldn't say Kundalini because he wouldn't know what that was. <laughs> and and I again, one of these things, I think my guardian angels overshadowed my department head because he said, well, Yvonne, you know, if you're doing research that's okay with me. And then he actually gave me some tips on how to do this without running into too many obstacles at the university. So in 1990, that's what I did. I publicly specialized in this. I sent out an announcement to um, all the doctors of Ontario that I would accept referrals of patients who'd had, and I'd listed all sorts of stuff, past life, mem past life memories, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience. I tried to describe all this stuff, kundalini, mystical experiences, inspired creativity, near-death experiences. And my practice became flooded. I got so many people coming to see me. And um, sim similarly, the, the media picked up on this and I did a bunch of interviews and that generated way more people coming to see me. And um, so, yeah, so that is that it changed my life absolutely completely. And I loved I loved this. I loved being a groundbreaker, um, raising awareness 
publicly and I started writing books, public speaking, all that sort of stuff. But little did I know that the good Lord wasn't finished with uh, with with touching me with these profound experiences. Because Before I, we get on to the next mm-hmm. experience, let's let's throw in a couple of things here. So so first of all, um, I mean, that's just your experience in Toronto. So imagine how many people there must be all over the world having these experiences, uh, most of whom probably aren't fortunate enough to have someone like you that they can come to who will understand what's going on. But it, it really must be epidemic er- everywhere. And, you know, but kind of beneath the the surface of public uh, acknowledgement or official recognition um, or understanding. I would say that's absolutely correct. I mean, the organization I founded, uh, you know, coming up to the present in 2020 was Spiritual Awakenings International. So people can look at that online, Spiritual Awakenings International. And I'll be linking to all your websites from your page on BatGap. Excellent. And that's what I'm doing now in terms of trying to raise awareness globally about the whole spectrum of spiritually transformative experiences, not just near-death experiences, not just kundalini, but all of them, you know, past life recall, trans-dimensional experiences with UFOs, you know, clear audience, clairvoyance, clear sentience, all of these things. Did I mention past life memories? That's an important one. You um, did. <laughs> uh, okay. But, um, and, and now the medium seems to be online. You know, that that is the way to get the message out there. And really the focus of Spiritual Awakenings International and my focus now, because I've retired from medical practice, is to be a safe place for experiencers, a place that people who are having these experiences can come, that, that it's safe, they're validated, they can learn. We have various speakers talking about their research or their own experiences but also they can network with other people who are having awakening experiences. And I mean, this was a a calling from spirit. I got a a download to create Spiritual Awakenings International back in 2020. And I didn't know how many people would come, how many people would be interested. Unbelievable. It's blossomed. We have, I have to keep track, 87 countries, subscribers from 87 countries in just three years. And with our experience or sharing circles, having all types of STEs all over the world. So, you know, my direct personal experience validates exactly what you said. It is happening all over the world. But people are are saying exactly what you said, that they feel isolated they don't know where to find support. They they can't talk to their family. They can't talk to their friends. They can't talk to their doctors. So we're trying to provide a bit of a form for that online. And I mean, you are doing that with your show as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, to me, the fact that this is such a widespread phenomenon is the hope of the world. Um, yes. You know, I mean, when you look at the news, which I do, I, I, I'm kind of a news junkie and you see what's going on with the wars and climate change and economic catastrophes and pandemics and politics and all the stuff you can. I mean, I, I've had people get in touch with me in recent days saying the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Um, and if that were the only reality I were aware of, I think I would be quite um discouraged. But uh, I'm actually quite optimistic because I feel like there's this huge upwelling of consciousness taking place all over the world, which obviously isn't making the news, but which could just save the day in terms of, you know, humanity, not only surviving, but transforming into a very beautiful state, albeit with a great deal of chaos and turmoil during the transition. But I, I do think that there's there's more to go more that's going on than than we realize than most people realize and there is hope for, there is hope for the future oh uh, there is absolutely hope for the future <clears throat> i would agree with you and i agree that there's part of a a global spiritual awakening happening uh right now and i think that that is the hope for the future because um it's only by people working on themselves as individuals and 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 um, maturing psychologically and maturing spiritually <laughs> through their spiritual practices and their spiritual awakenings, are they be, a- be able to hold in their consciousness the concept of you know peace and harmony or universal brotherhood, and yet at the same time the reality that even though we're holding that, we have to defend our family when it's being attacked. 
you know, like in the Bhagavad Gita, you stand up and fight Arjuna. Sometimes we would prefer not to stand up and fight, but sometimes that is our responsibility because we're, you know, we're being attacked. So as I have found for my own spiritual process, and we, I'm just uh, aware that we're going to be running out of time, but I oh, we still be- have a good deal of time. We have another 40 minutes or so. Oh, we have another 40 minutes. Okay. Yeah. I thought, oh, okay. I thought we were finishing on the hour. Oh, good. No, no. <laughs> Cause, cause I want, I would like to be able to share, um, 50 my, minutes actually, uh, my next two so. near death experiences. Cause that relates a little bit. To okay. Before you do a question came in, which I want to ask, which is from Pat J in Switzerland. Pat asks, I am not, or says, I am not taking any drugs or alcohol for a few years now and practice quite intensive meditation. I have some signs of an active kundalini, some kriyas. Is it advised against any drug use, such as psilocybin mushrooms, even in a spiritual context? Correct. I I do not recommend use of drugs, even in what people consider a spiritual context. I'm just going to say there are some people out there who are promoting it, but I am not. In my experience, um, Using hallucinogenic drugs, number one, it it might explode you open faster than you want. That's number one. And so it can be dangerous. Number two, people who are mediums and intuitives who can perceive the aura have told me repeatedly, and I perceive this myself, that it actually damages our aura, that like, you know, making Swiss cheese in our aura, taking drugs of any kind, you know, and particularly ones that are affecting the brain, hallucinogenic ones. So I personally do not recommend them, even in a uh, people who are saying that's in a spiritual context. I recommend keeping your system as clear as possible of all toxins including hallucinogenic drugs. Okay, now just to play devil's advocate, because I'm people who were, 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 would be in favor of this would probably ask the following question. They'd say, yeah, but what about the research at Johns Hopkins and NYU and, and Robin Carhart Harris over in the UK and all these people who are getting tremendous results helping alcoholics stop alcoholism on a dime or, you know, stage four cancer patients no longer fearing death and having this marvel, marvelous experience that makes them realize they're not really going to die even when their body does and yada, yada, all kinds of different benefits. So would you be absolute in that conviction that one should never use it? Or would you say um, um, very I- judiciously under certain circumstances, it might be helpful? Um, he asked me specific, the question was specifically to try About him. and enhance right a kundalini awakening. So specifically to try and enhance a kundalini awakening or to initiate a kundalini awakening, I would, I would say no. Right. Uh, And I deep respect that there are some cultures where it is part of their shamanic tradition. And I'm not disrespecting that. If you're in that culture, you have that support. Fine. I'm now talking to a Westerner to another Westerner who's not in that tradition, who doesn't have that support. So for a Westerner who's trying to have a healthy kundalini awakening, I would say continue with your meditation practice and uh, continue with your inner work and detachment and reaching the stillness and the various objectives in your meditation practice that that will be the fastest route to have a healthy kundalini awakening. Now, when you talk about research where, yes, there are doctors doing research and psychologists of using psychedelic drugs as a drug, as an intervention uh, to help people with specific um, issues, you know, people with depression or people with anxiety, or you were saying with alcoholics. And there are different methods of trying to uh, have interventions with people with various mental health challenges. That's a completely different topic. That's using psychedelics as a drug treatment to help with a particular condition. And um, if they're finding good results with that, great, you know, and the people are using that with success, wonderful. But I'm answering the question specifically for somebody who's already having a kundalini awakening and wants to deepen in it, no, that's not the way in my in my 40 years experience. No, drugs is not the way to do that. And also for people who might be listening who have not yet had a kundalini awakening and would like to awaken it, I also would say that is not my recommendation. I would recommend meditation and doing your 
work to try and live a life with integrity following the universal spiritual laws. And I would agree with you. Um, you know, I, I've been meditating since I was 18 myself, uh, having taken drugs for a year before that with disastrous, well, with mixed results. It, it showed me that there was more to life than meets the eye, but it also got me pretty messed up over the course of a year. Mm -hmm, uh, and exactly. then meditation from the outset was extremely helpful and healing and strengthening and exactly. invigorating and so on. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're about to launch into a new chapter. <laughs> so, so uh, in 1990, this chapter of my life opened up uh, and I wrote my first book. Um, it's called A Farther Shore. I don't even have it on its display. I have six books now that I've written, written or co-authored. Um, I wrote my first book on spiritually transformative experiences. And I thought, that was sort of going to be my life path. And um, I was not expecting, because back then, there used to be this concept of that you had one near-death experience, and then the rest of your life was influenced by that. So I thought, okay, I've had my one near-death experience. And similarly with Kundalini awakening, that you have like this one awakening, there was very little understanding about the lifelong process of spiritual deepening, spiritual cleansing, spiritual opening that happens after Kundalini awakening. It doesn't stop. It continues and it continues to this day. And we all have to be careful no matter how long we've been on the spiritual path because we'll have some little shadow issue that'll come up and try and grab us right when we expect at least. So we have to be humble and realize we're in a process and anyone can fall at any point in the path. Anyway, moving right along, much to my surprise, in 1995, I had another near-death experience in a near-miss plane incident. And um, and this one, uh, uh, tell me how much time we have again. <laughs> oh, we have another half, uh, another, another 40 minutes. Good. Okay. Because I want to also make sure we have time for my most recent near death experience, which is the juicy <laughs> one. So I'm going to, I'm going to make this one short. Okay. So I was in a plane, um, traveling to Toronto. I was coming back from a, a, an engagement where I was promoting, uh, my book on spiritually transformative experiences that was out at that time. We flew into a, a winter storm. And I remember thinking, oh, isn't that interesting? My plane crash NDE was in a winter storm. I uh, no, no, don't, don't think about it. Then um, I looked out the window and I could see ice forming on the wing. And I'm thinking, huh, they say it was ice forming on the air filter that caused our plane crash. And then I thought, okay, I better read my paper. I don't know why I'm thinking about that, that, that NDE plane crash all of a sudden. So I, I was picked up the newspaper that I had there to read. And I looked at the date and it said March 27th. I was going, March 27th? You know, because March 27th was the date of my plane crash NDE. I thought, what am I doing flying on March 27th again? How could I, how could I book the ticket for March 27th? And, you know, the planes being jostled with turbulence and all this stuff. And I'm looking at the date. I'm looking at like I'm blinking, hardly believing my eyes. And then it's like literally like, they depict this on TV now sometimes that the, the letters started swirling and then it changed to read what it really said on the page, which was February 27th. It's like, holy mackerel, what, what was that all about? Well, anyway, as it turned out, it was like, I guess my consciousness was giving me premonitions that I was about to have another near-death experience because that's in fact what happened. As the plane, it was a big commercial Air Canada plane was coming into Toronto International Airport, um, right before the, and really bad turbulence because of the storm, right before we were about to touch down on the landing, uh, to land, the, the pilot had to abort the landing because there were coyotes on the runway, he later told us. And he I was wondering suddenly, about that. Why wouldn't the coyotes be afraid of the jet when they heard it coming and run off the runway? But anyway, he, no he decided idea. it was dangerous, he, so he that, tried that, to abort. Supposedly, that's a, a hazard, you know, if animals are on the runway and you crash okay. into them anyway. So yeah. he, he, he had to abort the landing. He flipped the flaps back, and then he was racing the engines, and the whole plane was shaking like crazy. And... And it was like, oh, my God, we're going to die. People in the plane started going hysterical. We're going to crash. We're going to crash. People were throwing up and crying. It was. <laughs> and what happened to me was like, oh, I get it. That's why I was having all those thoughts that I'm going to crash today. Today is the day that I'm going to die. I was meant to live through that other plane crash. 
um, so that I could write my book and do the work that I have. And today is the day that I'm going to die in a plane crash. So by this point in my spiritual journey, I had already learned that the most auspicious way to die is consciously. So I decided I was going to consciously die. And I went into meditation. My only attachment in the world was my son. So I, I said, Lord, please look after my son. And then I went deep into meditation and I went deep and I went fast. I went far. And all of a sudden I found myself out of my body and I'm rising up, up through this vast expanse of space, up, up, up towards the light, but different from the last time, the last near death experience. It was like this force took me and lifted me up. This time I was swimming with the force. Like I was pushing with it, with my consciousness. I was striving with my consciousness while I was meditating to go as high and as deep as I possibly could. And the air, the area around me turned this deep, 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 uh, blue. And then all of a sudden, poof, in front of me appeared this being of light. But this being of light was of the same deep, blue color that my surrounding was and and was a translucent being of light and this being of light was like uh nothing i had ever seen before or ever seen since it was um half male and half female as i recall um the left half i believe was male uh, female and the right half was male and it was standing in a unusual posture you know like with the hand one hand upheld one hand doing something else and one of the legs was upheld and and the only thing I've seen uh, since that that looks a bit like that is in yoga, the dancing Shiva. But the dancing Shiva is not of two sexes, but it was a posture like the dancing Shiva. And Krishna was, is blue, but yeah, doesn't yeah. have the half and half thing either. Yeah, yeah. And and, the, and and doesn't have four arms. Like I think you said this one had yes, four arms. Yes, four yeah. arms, as I recall. Yeah. And, and this being, there was no... Um, I did not recognize this being, um, but it, it seemed to have a, 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 a an energy that was benevolent. Okay, that's the best I can describe, an energy that was benevolent. And it telepathically communicated to me, it is not your time. And just like that, as soon as it said it is not your time, boom, I'm back in my physical body again in the plane. And the plane is, you know, still in peril, still shaking, but the pilot did. And, and I, as I looked, I think my third eye was wide open because I could actually see like a force field of light, like hands of light holding the plane. And so I sort of knew we were going to be okay. And sure enough, we were. And and the plane pilot finally, man, finally managed to pull the plane out and um, circle around and explained what happened and later landed. Now, after we landed, um, I was in a... Um, a very unusual state of consciousness because what it felt like was like I had no skin. It was, you know, normally we have a sense that our boundary ends where our skin is, you know, that this is where I end, where my physical body ends. But it literally felt like I had no skin, that I was open. There was nothing separating me from the world around me. And so I went home that evening, you know, took my taxi, whatever it is. I had to get home from the airport and had a very, very deep sleep. And then the next morning when I woke up, I was in a unitive state of consciousness. I was home. How, how it literally felt was like um, I no longer had a top of my head where I where the top of my head used to be was now open. And it and I was directly connected and like an appendage of that universal loving force behind the universe that we are all a part of. And in this state of communion, I mean, it might seem grandiose to some people for me to say that, but there was nothing grandiose about the experience at all. In fact, it was incredibly humbling because in this experience of oneness, in this experience of communion 24-7, I was also completely aware and could perceive within my own consciousness and being that all sentient beings, everyone, all sentient beings are equally connected. That we're all like, uh, I, I call it a million legs, a billion legs of a millipede, right? <laughs> they were all like little legs that were all equally connected. The difference was 
that most people have like a veil in their consciousness. So they're not aware of, they're not able to perceive the connection. Whereas for me, that veil had been removed and I was aware of the connection. And while in that connected state, it was any information I needed. I didn't need to like look it up in a book or something. I would just come to me. I would just through intuition. I would just know. Um, you know, there's a saying in yoga before enlightenment, chopping wood and haul, hauling water after enlightenment, chopping wood and hauling water. <laughs> and it was exactly what it was. I didn't tell anybody. I had no need to tell anybody. There was. I I did my regular work, you know, I, I went to work, I saw patients, I paid my bills, I drove my car all the time in this incredible, blessed state of unit of consciousness. And when I was in my office, the, the psychotherapy work I could do with my patients was phenomenal because, you know, when they'd walk into my office, even before they'd open their mouth, as soon as I picked up their energy field, I would immediately know that because the intuition was just wide open what their issues were that they were wrestling with right now. And I would also know how I could best help them in our therapy session. So, I mean, it was just incredible um, how I was able to help people while in that state. But what I found as time went on is that, um, you know, because world get attachments, you get into your ego, that my consciousness would start to contract. And then what I'd have to do is I'd have to meditate. I'd have to put my consciousness, my focus here on my third eye center and meditate and then it would be like I would pop into the full communion again and then um as time went off on I'd have to do that more frequently that I'd find myself starting to contract and I have to meditate to get into that that full unit of state again and then finally after about two months I was no longer able to get into that unit of state through my meditation now this experience also changed me profoundly because it made me realize that what the saints and yogis and adepts have talked about is possible. It is possible for an ordinary human being like me, <laughs> you know, that it's not just something remote that only happens to the saints up in the Himalayas, that, that it, 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 I've been given a taste. It is possible. And that I yearned, I yearned to be able to come back to that state of consciousness. So it became my spiritual goal. It was like there was a shift that happened to me that before this experience, most of my goals were out in the world about being of service to others, informing people about STEs, counseling experiencers. After this experience, it was like my heart changed into Yes, I'm still going to do all that stuff. Yes, I still feel called to be of service. But my highest goal now was my inner goal, my spiritual practice, my spiritual deepening. It's like this yearning awoke in me, this yearning to be in communion. And I talk about this in my book, um, Soul Lessons from the Light, about how I've now learned about the different stages people go through on their spiritual path. And that, you know, first there's the original awakening and it puts you on your search and you start researching and exploring different paths. And then further on in our path, we reach, then that's called the propelled heart stage. And then later on in the path, many of us have had enough of our searching. We find the path that we want to follow. And that's called the steady heart phase. And at that stage, service becomes really a big part of our life. And, and I exemplified that completely. It's like, I knew, okay, I'm a yogi. And yes, I'm being called to be of service. So service was what my life was about. Service, service, service. But after this experience, it was like I shifted to what in yoga is called the devoted heart stage, which was, yep, I'm a devotee. I am seeking God and I will serve however the divine is calling me to serve. But my highest goal is reaching, you know, cleansing, purifying myself so that I can be a clarified instrument. And at this stage in my life, it's very much about, and for others who are at this stage, it's very much about detachment, learning to let go of stuff, you know, discovering just how many things, desires we have that we're attached to and learning to let go, learning to detach so that we can, and healing what needs to be healed, whatever comes up so that we be God's instrument. So my, 
my spiritual practice, my personal spiritual practice became a much more central and important passion in my life after that experience in 1995. Do you find there's a stage or has it happened to you where um, the desperate yearning feeling uh, for the divine settles down because there's so much contentment and um, it's not, it's not like you're searching anymore. It's more like you're just deepening and exploring and learning and evolving. Uh, But there's not this sort of like enlightenment or bust kind of feeling because you're just feeling so content. Yes. That, 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 that does develop with time is that as one starts having through one sustained spiritual efforts and sustained meditation, one starts having deep experiences, then we move on to a stage where we're feeling peace. Yeah. And and we're feeling contentment. And Santosh and, uh, Patanjali yeah. calls it contentment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and so um and that but to get there, we go through this stage of intense yearning. And I'm just right. saying that that having been given a taste of the goal, it was like that awoke the yearning in me major big time. So, um, but, you know, I very strongly embraced my spiritual uh, practices. And as I said, I, I'm, I have been embracing for more than 20 years um, the path of Kriya Yoga as taught by Paramahansa Yogananda, having tried many other paths along the way. But but that's the one that's taking me the distance. And but much to my surprise, the good Lord was not finished sculpting the course of my life because then comes what happened in 2003. So 2003, November the 8th, 2003 is when I had my uh, most recent uh, and my fifth near death experience. And what happened that day is um uh, interestingly enough, astrologers had given me sort of a forewarning that they said, gosh, Yvonne, you know, November the 8th, 2003, it's, it's a, something called the harmonic concordance and the star, the stars are in the star of David alignment, which is really auspicious and it affects your chart directly. Something wonderful is going to happen to you that day that's going to advance you spiritually. And I thought, what on earth could happen that would advance me spiritually? I mean, I was so deeply into my spiritual practice, my spiritual path, my my writing is all spiritual, my patients are all spiritual. I thought, like, what on earth could happen? Ha, little did I know. (laughs) Anyway, what ended up happening that day is I went to Niagara Falls and I had a slip and fall accident on black ice, hit my head really hard on the rock pavement there, the cobblestone pavement, had a brain hemorrhage and a traumatic brain injury and died. And I was dead for a period of time. Now, interestingly enough, my experience that evening began a couple hours before I died. I had been meditating at the foot of the falls, at the foot of Niagara Falls. It's one of the power places I like to go to meditate uh, because the roar of the ohm vi- of the the, the falls is, is like it resonates with the ohm vibration that I find when I meditate there. I can go very deep very quickly. So I was meditating at the foot of the falls and I went really deep, really quickly. And all of a sudden, I found myself home again. I entered that state of communion that I had been striving to reach since that 1995 uh, near death experience after effect. And I was, I was in communion again and I found my way back home and a being of light appeared to me, a saint from my tradition. It was Mahavatar Babaji. And he telepathically communicated to me, welcome home. And, and I just felt complete contentment. I had no idea that I was about to die two hours later, but I was in that state of communion when I actually fell and had my head injury and died. And I'm sharing this with you because I think it was my end of life experience. You know, that many people right before they die talk about experiences where they're maybe seeing saints or they're talking to departed loved ones, you know, that the veil is thin right before they die. I think that was my end of life experience and it prepared me for my crossing over. And so when I hit my head, 
I found myself, a force greater than myself, raising my, me out of my body. And very rapidly, I was going upwards through a dark expanse of space. Some people might call it a tunnel. For me, it was a dark expanse of space. And I was going to the realm of light. And there actually was like a uh, like an entranceway that was radiating light that I was rapidly being rushed up towards. And standing there at the entranceway were two beings of light in light bodies that I instantly recognized, two saints from my tradition, Paramahansa Yogananda and Mahavatar Babaji. And they telepathically welcomed me and explained to me telepathically that my physical body had died and that my life as Dr. Yvonne Kaysan was finished and completed. And it was a feeling of congratulations, job well done. Like it was like a celebration. The feeling as I entered the light was like there was a, a celebration, a graduation party being held in my honor as I entered the light. And there were other beings of light there, but I didn't um, pick up faces or identities or anything like that. I was just absorbing the love and light and aware of Paramahansa Yogananda and Mahavatar Babaji. And as I entered the afterlife, I guess my ego mind was there like a little devil on my shoulder. <laughs> this little thought comes up. Uh-oh, here comes the life review. <laughs> that was the thought I had. Because, you know, from all my my uh, research and talking to so many NDE experiencers, I know that, that when one actually completely dies, many people have a life review. And I mean, I've tried to live a good life, but nobody's perfect and I'm not perfect. So this part of me comes up, oh, oh here comes the life review. And it was so incredible and so beautiful what happened. Because the two saints, like they could read my thoughts. They they knew that this thought had come up in my mind. And one of them, I think it was Yogananda, just turned and glanced at me. And with the glance, whoosh, there was this transmission and it just blew <laughs> the little devil on my shoulder gone. And with that transmission, with that glance came this deep, profound and beautiful understanding. And the understanding that I suddenly had was about the infinite love of the higher power, mother, father, God, just completely understands in that, in that infinite understanding, infinite love, how we all make mistakes, that it's all part of our learning process. And that just like a little child, when it's learning to walk, it's going to stumble, it's going to fall, it's going to bump its head, maybe it's going to break something when it falls. And the loving parent doesn't punish the child. The loving parent embraces and encourages the child to try again. You can do better next time. That I was being embraced with that kind of unconditional love. Like, just don't worry about that. And so with that, my heart just opened to just completely absorb the profound love that I was feeling of the higher power. And then it was like I shifted into... It's hard to have a vocabulary for the other side. So it, it, it's not a different place. I would call it maybe a different state of consciousness. I, I shifted into a state of consciousness where I was no longer visually seeing things, but it was that my consciousness now had vastly increased in its capacity to absorb knowledge and information. So it was as if my brain had turned from a Pentium 2 to a Pentium 100, right? I had just the huge capacity to very quickly absorb vast amounts of information all at once. And all of a sudden in this state, I re-remembered all of my past lives like just all at once. And it was like, I had been aware of many of my past lives previous to this, but it was like before I'd had pieces of a jigsaw puzzle where I'd seen many of my past lives, but now all the pieces are put together. It was a big coherent picture and it was an aha experience for me. It was like, of course, this is who I am. This is what my life journey was. Sorry, I can't hear you, Rick. Can't hear you, Rick. I, I I muted my mic. Um, wh when you remembered all those past lives, was it kind of like, oh, I learned this lesson in that life. I learned this that lesson in that life, and you could kind of see the significance of each life, or were they just characters on the stage? It, 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 no, it it, it was not. It was neither of the above. <laughs> okay. It was it was a completely integrated understanding of of 
the interconnectedness and the perfection of, you know, the intelligence behind this mosaic, uh, uh, just all at once, an understanding of how it is all connected. Um, it's like, Imagine that you're looking at a tapestry uh, uh, or um, a mosaic that's made up of a whole bunch of little pieces. Each piece in itself is something exquisite and beautiful if you looked at it individually, but which I could do if I wanted to. But but I was now looking at the whole mosaic and I see how putting all the pieces together was just perfect and it was beautiful and and it made who I was in the incarnation as Yvonne Kason finally makes sense because I realized like with this aha it's like hello <laughs> it's my soul you know from the context of Yvonne Quezon person born in Toronto Canada little doctor at U of T having all of these experiences made no sense at all but from the context of my many past lives it made absolute complete sense and I saw that my soul was just picking up from what I'd been like in previous lives, that I've had a kundalini awakening, mystical experiences, near-death experiences in many incarnations, and that I came into this incarnation with this proclivity. Uh, and so it, it felt like finally I knew who I was. Finally, I fit in my own skin. This was like, right, got it. This is me. <laughs> So it was it was actually a very profoundly healing experience and it happened all at once. I mean, very, very difficult to explain from how we absorb information and knowledge here on this side. And then another thing that was very uh, um, notable and very clear to me while I was in this state of consciousness, shall we call it, on the other side was I had a very clear awareness of how time passes differently on the other side compared to here. And I had a very clear awareness that on the other side, I could look into and experience what we here on earth perceive as the past, if I put my attention there. Or if I put my attention here, I could perceive and experience what we here on earth can perceive as the present and I could do the same with the future like looking at a different pebble in the mosaic right if I put my attention there then then that would become my reality and it also on the other side was very very clear that time could bend and loop according to how we perceive it here on earth I mean we perceive time to be linear you know right now this is happening a minute from now is the future two minutes from now is later but on the other side it, things could bend and loop we could go forward things could change um it wasn't linear like this the multi-dimensional nature of the universe was also just incredibly clear to me and that how we are only perceiving three i believe it's three dimensions they say we can perceive fourth time being the fourth and um and at the same time, I understood how we here on earth perceive things linearly. And there was such a feeling of understanding this complexity, yet it was really simple. It's very, very difficult to describe. Anyway, I was on the other side for a period of what I'm going to call timeless time because we can't tell time the same on the other side as here. It felt like I was there much longer that my physical body was was dead or unconscious. And then the two beings of light reappeared to me. So again, I was started with visual imagery again, and they telepathically communicated to me, you may now choose whether to incarnate into the body of a baby and or to return to the maimed form in order to serve Divine Mother. And at that point in my life, I was relating to the divine as divine mother. So that was a perfect way for the question to be added to me, asked to me. And similarly, I was dedicating my life to service. You know, uh, St. Francis prayer, make me a channel of your peace, make me a channel of your love was sort of my motto. And so to be asked to come back to serve was perfect to serve the divine mother. And I remember what happened is I was not given any details at all that I recall of what either incarnation would look like, the details. 
I was just given the choice. And immediately it felt like the response came out of my heart, not like it came out of my mind. It literally felt like it came out of my heart. And my heart responded. I was in such a state of ecstasy, openness, communion, surrender, trust in the wisdom of the higher part. There was no part of me that was questioning like what would be involved. No, it was, I just trusted the wisdom behind the universe. And I, my heart responded, oh, masters, please guide me. What is the higher choice? I want to do God's will. And then they so lovingly, I mean, how a telepathic thought can have that amount of love is very hard to explain, but it was exquisitely loving. The thought returned to me. It will be more difficult, but to return to the maimed body. And then my heart, again, without missing a beat, just instantly responded. I accept. And it was so fast. It was between the thought I and accept that (gasps) with a gasp of air, I found myself lying on the ground, starting to breathe air into my previously dead body. And it felt like waking up in an ice cube because I had died outdoors in winter in Canada and my body temperature had dropped. So I'm breathing life back into my body. And then for the first couple of minutes, I could see both realms at the same time superimposed on each other. I could see the worldly realm through my physical eyes, but I could also, I guess my third eye was wide open. I could also see the white light realm and it was superimposed like like a, 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 a what they call it, a double image photograph. When someone's taken two photographs, there were two images superimposed on the other. That's what it was like. I could see the white light realm superimposed, double exposure um, uh, on on this realm. And the two saints, Paramahansa Yogananda and Mahavatar Babaji and their light body were right there with me, which I think is so beautiful and so loving. Like not only had they welcomed me to the other side, and explain to me what was happening. But when it was time for me to come back, they were there with me and and right with me. And then what happened is slowly with time, the white light realm started fading, 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 fading until it just became a dot in my consciousness, which is still there. Thank God that dot in my consciousness. And then I was back and I was back with a disability. I was back with a serious traumatic brain injury uh, brain hemorrhage at the back of my brain, contra coup, frontal lobe injuries, both sides of the, the front of my brain, and then whatever happened in between. And to make a long story short, um, I was disabled. I was disabled by the traumatic brain injury um, for 12 years, despite my incredible effort, seven years of neuro rehab to try and get better. I had to accept that I was now permanently disabled. And that how I could serve now was through my prayers and my meditation. And there's a happy ending. Yes, there's a happy ending. I'll go right into happy ending. (laughs) So much to my delight and surprise, (laughs) you might wonder, everyone is listening, well, how come you're running Spiritual Weight News International and writing books and all this stuff if you're disabled? Well, a miracle happened to me. A miracle happened to me more than 12 years after my traumatic brain injury on February 24th, 2016. And, you know, just so you know, medical science says you don't heal 12 years after a traumatic brain injury. And I say, poo poo to medical science. Miracles do happen because I experienced a miracle. I was meditating deep in meditation in Encinitas, California at the Self-Realization Fellowship Retreat on a a spot where Yogananda used to meditate and go into samadhi. So it has a very strong spiritual vibration there, which is why I meditated there and have meditated there many times over the years. But on that particular day, all of a sudden when I was meditating, I experienced inwardly this burst of light. It was like a volcano where a fountain of liquid light erupted in the center of my brain. I could, I could see it inwardly. And it was literally like the lights came on. And subjectively, I had an experience of waking up and my brain was healed. I had a spontaneous brain healing experience with that eruption of light while meditating. And 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 the strong inner message was given to me, pass on what you have learned. And then it was like floodgates open of writing, writing, writing. And it wasn't that I was channeling. It was like, 
it was like I'd been pregnant for 12 years and now the babies were coming out. You know, they wanted to come out. And so that's why, you know, in the first nine months, I wrote two books, Touched by the Light and Soul Lessons from the Light. Uh, the first drafts of these books, of course, then you have to revise them and everything after you write the first drafts. But they're a product of a miracle. They're a product of my miracle healing. And then once I wrote my books, I realized, well, I'm going to have to start public speaking again or else nobody will know that my books are there to read. So I started doing podcasts like this one, speaking at conferences before COVID. And then Spirit gave me the download in 2019 that I was to start a new organization to raise awareness globally about spiritually transformative experiences and spiritual awakenings of all kind and our true spiritual nature that we're truly spiritual beings uh, here having a, a bodily experience as part of our school of life. And so that propelled me to found the organization that I'm now the president uh, of, which is called Spiritual Awakenings International, where we're we're running um, speaker events once a month, experience or sharing circles once a month, Spanish events once a month, in addition to our English ones, and an annual conference. Which so I'm sure all, are not limited to the Toronto area. This must be no, online stuff is, that is, people all over the world yeah, can do. Yeah, we have people from 87 countries around the world participating. Right. And uh, yeah, just go to our website. You can sign up. All our events are online at this point, and anyone around the world can participate. We do all our events for free. Uh, we're donation based, same as Rick. You know, if you want to give us a donation, we're grateful, but we offer all our events for free to make sure that finances is not a reason that people can't access this information. So I just want to wrap up with my bottom line. Uh, you know, after sharing my story, is that never give up hope. That's the message I want to leave everyone with. Never give up hope. Miracles do happen. I am a walking testimonial that miracles do happen. That much to my surprise, over 12 years after a permanent, supposedly permanent traumatic brain injury, I was healed. And if I can have a healing, anyone can have a healing. So never give up hope. Yeah, that's that's one of my bottom lines too. Another question came in. Let me ask you that one. Um, this is from Rob Holmes in the UK. Loving the interview with Yvonne. Her book, Further Shores, was the first book I read after my own unexpected spiritual awakening in September of uh, 2011. And it was so wonderfully helpful and supportive for me. It made me realize I wasn't going crazy. Question, what do you think was the reason for her awakening? Why did her soul choose this experience for her? Well, Personally, I don't think my soul chose this experience for me. I believe that it was the divine plan that this was, I was sent to serve. Although I was at the end given the choice to serve here or there, but <laughs> maybe my choice, my soul chose to serve and the divine said, okay, with which way, whatever. But, um, I, I, I think some people believe that we choose all the experiences that happen in our lives. I, I personally am not so sure that that is true. I think that there are um, infinitely intelligent and loving laws in the universe, like the law of karma, that um, determines to a large extent what experiences we're going to have. And that that in the between life, I mean, how, how Yogananda explains it is that that there's like this magnetism that will attract a soul to an incarnation that will provide that soul with the opportunities that they need. Now, do some people describe actually being given a choice or described things that they would experience? Yes, they do. So maybe that does happen for some people. But I'm just saying as a universal principle, I think it's the intelligence behind the universe and the laws of karma that draw us to the experiences. So now you say, here's me. I think that my soul... Um, from what I've seen uh, in my own spiritual awakening journey, which has gone on for many, many incarnations, has made a commitment to be of service many, many times, a long time ago, many, many incarnations ago. And so when the divine said, you know, do you want to go back to that injured body to serve? It'll be tough. I said, okay, I accept the assignment because that commitment to being of service in whatever way I can is a commitment my soul made many incarnations ago. 
Yeah, which shows that it was your decision, but it was sort of like given you were given the choice by some beings. And, and that's kind of the way I've heard it from others, too. Like that guy who wrote the Life Between Lives books. What was his name? Um, I forget. But anyway, you know, he he was saying that based upon his extensive experience in uh, hypnotizing and interviewing people that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're shown options like okay you can go into this life and these are some of the major events that you could have that would concur with your karma so mm -hmm. you know you you might have to undergo this difficult thing or that difficult thing and but you know if you choose to do this it'll help you work off a big load of karma and so it's kind of this collaboration between mm -hmm. the, the the incarnating soul and one's whatever beings are guiding us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. anyway um your story is wonderful. I really enjoyed your book, and uh, I've really enjoyed this interview. And you've you've obviously done a lot of them because you really can convey <laughs> a lot of information in in a relatively short amount of time. So I'm and I'm really delighted to discover what you're up to. I wasn't very much aware of it before pre preparing for this interview, but um, I, you know, you have a great resource up there which I'll certainly be um, referring people to. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I also really appreciate what you're doing in terms of raising awareness of our true spiritual nature and all these experiences too. I think it takes, you know, it takes a village. There's that saying, you know, yeah. it, it, it's not just, uh, I think uh, one of our goals of Spiritual Awakening International is to network with other groups and individuals all over the world who are trying to raise awareness about a true spiritual nature and are actually having firsthand experiences. Because I think this is really important too, that, that you know, as you were talking earlier on, that there are many in the world who are, are um, really locked into dogmatism and that mine is the right way and everybody else is wrong. And, and, and when one has a spiritual awakening and, and one starts experiencing um, glimpses firsthand, firsthand, of the universal love of the divine higher power, one learns, oops, I think we need to move out of being dogmatic and we yeah. have to try and grow into being more tolerant, more compassionate, more kind, more understanding. That's essential. It's critical in, in today's world mm -hmm, uh, for absolutely. so many obvious reasons. Okay, well, I'm sure we're going to be in touch. Uh, I'd like to stay in touch with you. So um, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to those who've been listening or watching. Um, and we'll see you for the next one. And I'll, I'll have a page up uh, for this interview on BatGap, which will have links to Yvonne's books and her websites and all this stuff so you can get in touch and follow up with her. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Rick. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Oh, you're very welcome. So oh, thank, thanks to everybody. Thanks you to Irene. And thank you to the dogs for not having coughing fits while we were trying to do this interview. <laughs> we'll yeah. uh, or the dog. Alrighty. Talk to you next time. Okay. Bye now. Bye.